was such a sad day for me today. I buried my husband of 49 years, Daniel Hall. Right here on this property, in fact. But you know, we didn't start our life here in, in 1835. Our family started their life in 1639 in Kentucky. Not really Kentucky, it was Connecticut. See what happens when you're all shook up when you bury your husband? You just forget where you're at sometimes. <laughs> so we, anyway, they started out in England and there was a reverend in England by the name of Reverend Henry Whitfield. And he was not exactly in favor of the church at that time, but he knew a lot of people in town. So and, and a lot of the people that he knew were rel relatively well off, and some of them were farmers. But he talked to all these people around town, and he convinced them that they should start a stock company and go to travel to New England. So in 1639, 40 families got on two ships. And on one ship, the St. John, was the Norton family and the Hall family. And they came over on the ship. But before they landed in Connecticut, they came together as a group and they wrote the New Guilford Covenant of 1639. And what this covenant did for them was they joined together and they said that as families and as a group, they would always help each other, they would build together, and they would never desert each other. And 25 families signed that covenant. And the Halls, William Hall, was on that document, and so was Thomas Norton. And Thomas Norton was my sixth great-grandfather, and William Hall was my husband Daniel's sixth great-grandfather. So the Halls and the Nortons came together on the ship. They had their covenant in place. They landed on the shores, and they were met by some Indians. Now, the Indians were very happy to see the English at that time because this particular group of Indians, there were only 33 members left in that tribe. They had been raided by other Indian tribes. People had died um, from their tribe of diseases brought over by um, the French fur traders and some Englishmen. So there were only 33 of them left. Oh, it's so hard thinking about all of this that, that my husband told me these stories and my father did, but I keep thinking back on it and I think, my goodness, there they are in this land with these Indians and, and what, how are we going to build? Well, the Indians welcomed them and the Reverend Whitfield on the ship when he landed, it is said that he had pockets full of cash. Now, the Englishmen that were on the ship, as I said, some of them were rather well off, and they brought with them some indentured servants. They brought with them some house servants. So they felt that they were ready to set up house and, and build their cabins and, and work the land. And that's what they did. And, and Reverend Whitfield convinced the Indians that he needed a stone house. So those Indians gathered stones and they built this wonderful little stone house for the Reverend. And that home is still there today. It is the oldest stone home in Connecticut. Still there, you can see it. So the stone home is built and then the Englishmen sat down with the, with the um, Indians and they looked at the property and they actually drew lines of property lines. And they said, we would like to have this property, and the Indians can have this property, and they signed a treaty. And everyone was happy. They were happy about this treaty. It helped the Indians, and it helped the English. And the English paid them in coats, in shoes, in cooking utensils, in wampum. And the wampum is what they used to trade with other um, people or other Indian tribes. And so they had, they had their wampum, and they had their things, and they were very happy and they helped the English settlers, and the English promised that they could hunt and fish those lands, whether it was the Indian lands or the English lands, for, their, for all of their life. And they did well into the beginning of the 19th century. So the covenant is in place, the stone house is built, 
the Nortons in the in, in the halls actually built their homes and their little farms right next to each other. In 1639, they were neighbors. And then about 1650, the good reverend who signed the covenant decided, hmm, I miss England. So he took off. He was the first one to break the covenant. He left for England. And behind, he left his wife and nine children. So the other, that was the good reverend. So we might hear about a bad one, I don't know. So he took off and, and he went to England and he lived there and seven years later, he passed away. He never came back to New England. So the Halls and the Nortons lived in Connecticut in this New Guilford area for over 150 years. None of those families broke that covenant. And then in about, oh, 1750s, the area of Connecticut had the highest per capita population of any of the New England colonies. And my father, Jerry, said to my mother, I think it's getting a little crowded here. I want to go west. So they loaded up the, the covered wagon with myself, and I was two and a half years old at the time, and my sister Mary, who was one, put us in that wagon. We traveled 600 miles across to Atwater, Ohio. It took us, oh, we traveled about, mm, I think I was told about 10 miles a day we made in that cover wagon. And when we got there in 1812, my mother had her third child, and we lived there, in that, and all of the children grew up in this Ohio area. And I was about 22 years old, and I kept hearing my mother say, Jerry, what are we going to do with Sarah? She's 22, she has no husband, and we don't have any grandchildren, and all the girls around here are married. They all have a husband, they all have children, but our Sarah is 22 and she is not married. What are we going to do? And I heard this over and over and over again. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go to, um, back to Connecticut and I'm going to visit some relatives there. So off I took, all by myself, and I went to Connecticut in the spring. And when I was in Connecticut, I met a young man by the name of Daniel Hall. And oh, I want to tell you, it was instant. <laughs> he saw me, I saw him. We chatted and we talked and we just knew. Now my middle initial is D. And he kept saying to me, Sarah, what does that D stand for? And I didn't really want to tell him, but I finally said, delight. And he said, let's get married. Now, I don't know why he thought that middle name was just the perfect middle name for his wife, so we did. So we got married in December of that year, and we, we stayed in Connecticut for just a little bit, and then the next spring, we decided it was time to go to Ohio and see my family. So we loaded up that, that wagon and that, put the cover on and put a few things in there and went to Ohio. And when I got in Ohio, I had my first child, William Edward, or Edward William. He gets called both things. Sometimes we just call him Ed for short. But there we are. We're in Ohio, and I have my first child. So we're there for another three years. And during that time, I lost three children. And then my husband, oh my gosh, just like my father, says to me one day, it's getting a little crowded here. I think I want to travel. I want to go north. So we loaded up a wagon at, at, near, in Ohio, and we took that wagon to Cleveland. Myself and my three-year-old son, my husband, we get to Cleveland, we get on a steamship, and we go to Detroit. Now we get in Detroit, we don't have anything. So we buy a wagon and two oxen, and we buy some tools, some cutting tools, some shovels, those sorts of things, and off we take down the Grashit Turnpike. Coming up the Grashit Turnpike, and we're going along, going along, and you know, it was, it was a little rough traveling, but not, I didn't think it was so bad. 
And all of a sudden, Daniel says to me, this is where we turn. And he turns the oxen, and I look. Now imagine this. I look out there. I don't see a, a, a bare prairie. I don't see grass fields. What do I see? I see virgin forest everywhere, huge trees everywhere. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, Daniel. He says, well, we'll just knock those trees down because we need to go in that direction. So we did. We got out our tools. We cut enough trees down that we could get our wagon and our oxen down that path. And this is where we ended up, right here in 1835. Oh, my gosh, what an adventure that was, let me tell you. We built a little log home. And in 1837, well, actually between 1835 and 1837, my father decided he was going to travel here a little bit too. And so he saw all that property over there across from us. And he decided he needed 320 acres over there. And in 1839, both my father and my husband um, signed the papers necessary to get this property and that property, although they were already building here, but it was signed by President Van Buren. We still have those papers yet today. Built that little log cabin, and in 1837, my father said, you know, we have not had a religious ceremony here yet. I think we need to have a ceremony. So in that little log cabin, my father, Jerry Norton, held the first religious ceremony, and it was for the Methodist Church. And that was the seed that planted the Methodist Church that is still in Richmond today, and it is the oldest religious church in the community. Started right here on this property. The next year, my little William was five, and we always valued education. The Nortons did, the Halls did, we always wanted education. And there wasn't a school, no school to be had. Now, also in 1835, the Beebe's came to this area. So we came from this direction, and we cut the trees down, which is now Main Street. The Beebe's came from the Armada area. They had actually walked from New York to Armada area. They came from the Armada area up Armada Ridge and settled in that area. Now, they did not want to be farmers like my husband. He thought farming was everything. They wanted to start a little town, and they ended up with a blacksmith and a general store and some other things that people needed in the area. So the Beebe's had two children. I had one. And then the Hicks family also lived out there, and they had two children. Now, we had heard that Mahala Weeks was an excellent teacher. So my husband sought her out, and she agreed to come and teach these six children in 18... Um, oh, yes, now let me think. Now, what year was that? Yes, 1838. She came to our little log cabin. I put, hung a quilt in the cabin. So we had a designated area just for the school. And Mahalo Weeks taught those six children that year in the school. The next year, we all got together and built another little um, structure next to our house. And that was the school from then on. Oh my, I'm running over a little bit, aren't I? <laughs> anyway, so they built that, they built that school there. And I raised a family here, I had more children, and my husband, my, my father Jerry, he went back and forth from here to Ohio, from here to Ohio, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. In 1850, my brother James was here, and my sister Ellen was living with them, with him at that time. And lo and behold, she met Henry Beebe and married him. And so she moved to town and lived with her husband in town. And then my brother, the next year, married a woman. And about 10 years later, they bought the Hicks property out there on Armada Ridge. So we all lived here in this area for, for many, many years. And we're all buried in this cemetery. Also in 1850, that was such a big year for the family. Oh, everything was happening. My sister got married. My brother got married. And my father, or, uh, my husband Daniel, decided we needed a proper cemetery. So he talked to some of the people in the area, and together they got together and decided this property of his 
would be the perfect place to have a cemetery. So in 1850, he gave to the community property for a cemetery. And, and, that's, and this is the property that you see today. Now, I was so very happy to raise my family here. I lost one daughter when she was just seven years old. But the rest of my children I saw grow into adulthood. And oh my gosh, that was so rewarding to see that happen. I had a son, Daniel Webster um, Hall, and he served in the Civil War, and he came back here and lived here. And the last children I had, I was 44 years old, and wouldn't you know it, it runs in the family, I had twins, twin boys. <laughs> Oh my gosh, let me tell you, at 44 years old, trying to keep those little twin boys out of the streams, in the woods, and away from the animals, and all of those things, oh my gosh, it just, it went on endless. And then the Grand Trunk Railroad came to Richmond, and things really started to change around here. Oh my goodness. I would get Carrie and Adeline, and those two boys and we'd go to town and wait for the train to come in. And all those boys would holler and shout and wave. And oh, it was the biggest day for them when they could go to town and see the train come into town. Now, the girls were excited about it, too, but not quite as much as those little twin boys. They were six at the time. And trying to get them climbing on that tree was, I'll tell you, it took me and a whole, a whole team of people to keep them off of that train. But the girls... They wanted to see what all the ladies were wearing when they got off the train because that was at an age when they were really starting to notice that people dressed for occasions and those sorts of things. And before that, we never did. We had one dress and we would put on an apron over our dress because the apron kept our one dress from getting soiled. And we would have a daily dress and we would have a dress up dress like to go to church or funeral or something like that and and when our dress wore out we took that fabric and we would try to make pillows out of it or little shirts for the children we did not throw anything away so the girls at that age loved to see the fashion and they would just get so excited about the trains and like I said I was able to see all my children grow into adulthood which was wonderful. My daughter Adeline lived to be 98 years old. My daughter Carrie lived to be 94 years old. I lost one son in adulthood um, in a threshing machine accident. That was Daniel Webster. And I lost one son with runaway horses. So we were still in the fields using horses and farming. But I have to tell you, I was so very proud of all of my children and all of the ways that they lived and their commitment to education and to the Christian way of life. And um, now my daughter Carrie is going to tell you about her life growing up here and the connections that her family made to people and those connections that are still here today. Well, you've heard from mom, our life was pretty exciting and pretty special. Um, got most of, of what happens during the time I was growing up. So I'll just basically start um, when I got married, which was in 1868, and that was to Charles Franklin Mills. Charles had actually been born in New York in 1845, but lived in the area um, from the time he was two years old. He came with his parents, but um, lost his dad, and so he ended up living with Andrew Stort. And Andrew had lived in Richmond Township since 1859. Um, there is a connection there with the Mahalo Weeks um, with Andrew Stort. After we got married, we lived in Armada for a few years, and then the magic of getting drawn back to Richmond happened, so we came back and Charles worked on the farm and we lived here for the rest of our lives. Um, Charles was active in community affairs, he was a highway commissioner, was on the township board, member of the Maccabees, member of the Masons. Um, 
So our family got very active in the community um, in many ways. We had two daughters. Our first daughter, Ella, was born in 1870. And in keeping with the education that my mother told me about that she was so very proud of, um, Ella graduated in one of the first graduating classes from Richmond High, which was in 1887. And she taught in Columbus Township and then at Richmond High um, until 1898 when she married Charles Lutz. So Charles carried on his father's horse-shipping business, um, and his father supplied horses to the Detroit Street Railway System. And Charles continued on with that, and then he also started an auto business. And he got into the financial world also. And he ultimately became president of the National Bank of Richmond. Um, he passed away in 1839 after a very short um, illness. The Woods Farm was on division. And um, we lived there for a good length of time. Um, Charles and Ella had four children. The eldest daughter, Frances, in keeping with the family tradition of education, completed college, and then she married Russell Hofstetler. When you're 91, you know, it's kind of hard to keep all those names straight and say them properly. Russell worked in the wholesale um, drug business, and they lived in Detroit, then moved to St. Clair, so she was nearby. The second child, Charles Luther, only lived to be eight years old. He had a heart problem. Sarah Winford was their third child, and she took education to the next level. Um, she actually got degrees from U of M, Syracuse, and Cornell, and then was Dean of Women at Syracuse, and Arizona, and Idaho, and the University of Michigan, and Alabama. And at Alabama, she was instrumental in um, charting a path to successful integration. And in fact, um, if you were on previous cemetery walks, you may have heard about her. She married Harry he Healy, and then after his passing, Mr. Fenton. We didn't see much of Sarah because, as you can tell, she was everywhere in the United States. Um, so we just didn't see as much of her. Um, Philip Arthur was the fourth child of Ellis, and he attended U of M, and then he followed in his father's footsteps and became an old stealer. He was also on the village council, and he was married to Dorothy Sattler. Um, he was known by many people in his business. Um, he actually had started here in 41. Um, I passed away in 42, so we did not see the full fruition of his business, but I'll tell you a little bit about it later when I step out of this role. Second daughter, Myrtle, our second daughter, was born in 1872. She married Warren Stone, and Warren was the son of Sanford. Sanford built Roseburn, which many of you know as the um, large white house over in the Beebe Street area. And um, Warren was an attorney in Richmond. He was also the um, village attorney, village treasurer, and chairman of the county democratic committee. Um, he did very well and went on to become an assistant prosecuting attorney in Mount Clemens. And he and Myrtle moved to Mount Clemens, so they spent their later life there. He retired from practice in about 1934. They had one daughter, Madeline. Madeline, in keeping with the educational um, interest of the family, attended U of M, and then she married a Texas attorney and lived in Texas for the rest of her life. I remained here in Richmond, living for my in my own home for many years, and then in the last years of my life, moved in with Ella on the corner of Maine and Jefferson, and um, did. Um, a thing in the 1940s with Alice Beaverdorf, and if you're familiar with Sketches of Richmond, which is something she wrote, I gave um, an account of the family to her. Um, sitting in front of you is a stone that says Caroline Hall, and 
that's actually my sister-in-law. I was Benjamin's favorite sister. <laughs> and so he actually went out and found the Carolyn to marry. So it looks a little confusing when you see that because of the date. My stone is actually over there with my husband's and with Myrtle and um, Warren Stone. Ella is buried in the boots portion of the cemetery. Um, just for an interest, and I'll step out of my role as um, Caroline. Um, for those of you who might know a little bit about Filler, um, he was the Oldsmobile dealer. He Oldsmobile dealer. He started out behind the National Bank, behind which is now PNC, and then eventually moved over into what is now um, the Marathon Gas Station. The thing about Phil was he was he took anything in trade. So whether it be pigs, horses, you name it. So his motto was, I trade for anything, and he literally did. Um, he, in 1946, then took um, into doing GMC trucks along with the Oldsmobile, and they also opened a full-service um, auto place. And just as an interest, I mentioned to you about the Lutz Farm. That is the site of Richmond High School. So that is the mill story. Paul Mill story. Very good. Well, thank you. Is James Henry Quick. I'm the son of Henry Quick. Henry John Quick. You'll you'll actually this works really good. He's buried way down there, just beyond where you were, towards the front before the trees, you'll see his cemetery plot. And I'll try to point other things out as we go along. Well, my parents were Henry John Quick. He was born in 1808 and died in 1993. He married Catherine Van Nordstrand. Uh, she was born in 1799, and Ma passed away in 1881. We came to the area here from a place known to you as Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. Came from Brooklyn, New York. You know, I was, I was racking my brain with everyone. I, it's either 1849 or 1850, I think, is when we came to the area. But I'm gonna pass this around. I'm very proud of that. That's my kind of good boy award or citizenship award from the New, uh, New York City Public Schools. And I've kept that a lot of years. Uh, where we lived was at the very northern tip of Brooklyn. And so dad was really tired of just being cramped in the big city and, and uh, like so many, that came to this area from the east. Uh, we came part of the way via, via the Erie Canal and came to um, Columbus Township, just to the east of what is now Richmond. But at that time, there was no even sense of Richmond. Uh, it was BB's Corners here, <coughs> Cooperstown, and Ridgeway. Uh, Dad purchased land at the corner of Kroner and Pound Road. Uh, and what we did was set up to be farmers. So I was 14 and my younger sister's oh, six. Yeah, they still have wind, don't they? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. A lot of work. You can imagine coming in the early 1850s you know not all of the area was totally clear a lot of trees to take out a lot a lot of work uh, but we had a beautiful farm um, in fact when I was around town over the last uh, month or so the barn that my son Bert and I'll talk about him later built just to 
what would be to the north of Croner Road as it hits Gratiot. There's a barn across the street about oh, 50 feet, 50 to 100 feet off of the road. That, that was a quick barn. Um, in fact, I was talking to my great-great-grandson. He didn't even know that until about a month ago. <laughs> so that's my barn? 10111? I think so. Croner and... Well, it fell down. Come yep. get a piece. <laughs> yes, it, that's that's the barn I'm talking about. Yep. Uh, so, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of history of myself, as well as part of the family history, as, as we go through this. Um, a little farther down the road, on, on Pound Road, was the Weeks family. And so, it took a little bit of courting. But I married Adelia Weeks in 1857. Later that year, William Henry was born. Our first son, William's buried right here. Then came James Elbert, otherwise known as Bert. Bert is buried there with his wife, Ida. And we'll talk about her in a little bit. And then there was David Weeks, who, who came later. We built uh, a home there at the corner of Croner and Pound Road. The home is no longer there, but Bert and William, or he went by Billy, their two homes still remain. Many of you of a certain generation may remember um, the um, Delaney's lived in what is Bert's, what was Bert's house. It's now there right on the corner. Uh, it's, I think, dark gray now. Um, it was, it was, it was always a lighter color as I remember. But uh, it, uh, that was their house. And later I'll show you some pictures. Uh, I'll get some pictures here to show of the inside of that house. Then Billy's was just farther west. And our home was right in between, but that home was no longer there. Um, just a little bit of perspective about what the town was like at that time. In 1857, when, when Billy was born and we were married, it was only two years later that the first railroad tracks came through town. In 1859. Was it soon after, it was not long after, another two years, in 1861, when there was the rebellion, and talked it over with Bella, and it was very important to me to serve my country and to save the Union. So, ironically enough, I mustered out in Fort Wayne on September 11th. 1861. I was part of Company E of the 5th Michigan Infantry. We were known as the Huron Rangers Riflemen. And there's a portrait of our symbol. I'm very, very proud of my service, and I'll share some more as we go along, but My son Bert gave this to me. At the turn of the century, and I was I was lucky enough that I could I I had a copy. But what they did was for all of the infantry units, the state of Michigan commissioned a history of all the units that were in the war. And so this is a or this is the story of the fifth. Michigan Infantry. I'd like to read you some excerpts of that. The 5th Michigan was organized at Fort Wayne, composed of companies named below, recruited min mainly at the points designated. The Sherlock Guard out of Detroit, the Mount Clemens Rifle Guard, Mount Clemens, East Saginaw Volunteers, East Saginaw, the Ingersoll Rifles, Owasso, the Governor's Guard of Detroit, the Saginaw City Light Infantry of Saginaw City proper, Livingston Volunteers, Brighton, 
the Washington Guard out of St. Clair to the east of here, the Pontiac Volunteers out of Pontiac, and the Huron Rangers out of Port Huron, my unit. We mustered into service with about 900 officers and men, and we left on a train for Washington. As at that time, they were, uh, there's General McClellan for the Army of Potomac, we were joining him. And from there, we uh, had several skirmishes, and then the first major campaign outside of the Washington, D.C. area was through the wilderness the first time. That would be, they'd come back there later, but the first time. And the first real engagement was at the Battle of Williamsburg, Williamsburg, Virginia. Many of you may know Williamsburg from colonial times with the House of Burgesses and, and, and all of that, but it was a major Civil War engagement and certainly for the 5th Michigan. We were led by General Terry, or by um, um, our Colonel, Colonel Terry, and let me just find the expert excerpt. Uh, I'm going to read from about what he had to say later about the battle. After waiting a few minutes, we pushed up double quick. We soon began to meet the wounded being carried down the road from the battlefield from which the sound of artillery and musketry came nearer and nearer distinctly. We were soon met by uh, those that were by General Heidelsman's staff and said, the general says you must hurry on, you, you may be too late. The order double quick was at once given and the regiment pressed until work was taken. That was for the 5th Michigan. There's an account in here, uh, you know, of from General McClellan. Without waiting further for official reports, which have not reached me, I wish to bear testimony to the splendid contact of Hooker and Kearney's divisions under General Heitzelman in the Battle of Williamsburg. Their bearing was worthy of veteran Hooker's division of ours gallantly withstood at the attack of general superior numbers with heavy loss. Kearney's crew arrived in time to restore the fortune of the day and came most gallantly into action. I shall probably have occasion to call attention to the commands and do not wish to, to do any injury to them by mentioning them now. Had I full information I now, I now have in regard to the troops above named, when I was first telegraphed, they would have been specifically mentioned and commanded. I spoke only of what I knew at the time and shall rejoice to do full justice later. So my personal story of that day is when we were ordered up sometime during the battle, I lost my trigger finger in the battle. That would have been on May 5th, 1862. For that, I was discharged. I was honorably, honorably discharged from the service and sent home. So my stay in the war was relatively short. I had signed up for a three year enlistment uh, and, and fully intended to fulfill that. But a rifleman without a trigger finger didn't have a lot of value. Now, remember though, as I think back upon it, that, you know, the war went on for another three plus years, but the Union at that time felt that this rebellion's not going to last that long. It would, and it did. There's a lot more in that book to share, uh, and I'll do, and I... I just don't feel I could do it justice to go over it that much. But they would, there's records in here of all the battles that they were in. Um, I, uh, I would follow it, in, you know, with what reports I could get. You know, other friends that were in the unit 
came back over time and I'd, I'd hear where they were, but they were heavily engaged with the Battle of Gettysburg on day two. For those of you familiar and know anything about that, they were between the peach, peach orchard and the wheat field. The picture I have is that monument for the myth. Fifth Michigan. It's the only one on a battlefield and it does commemorate my boys. We sustained heavy casualties at Williamsburg, had heavy casualties that day in Gettysburg. We were even at Appomattox Courthouse at the end of the war. That is recorded that, you know, and I, so I got to hear how that all played out. Remember, General Custer, another Michigander, was there too. Um, so, that's kind of my story. Um, I could try to answer further questions, or we can look at that if we have, have time. But I came back after the after my time there. You know, learned to adapt to my not having a finger and um, continue to farm. Uh, I would also uh, be a member of the Congregational Church of Columbus, my dad. If, you, if you'll notice, um, in a lot of history of the town, he's known as Deacon Quick. He was one of the original founders of that Congregational Church. I would also become involved in government, I'm not going to call it politics, because I don't want to go down that train, <laughs> but uh, I did serve as Columbus Township Clerk and in 1870 uh, served as supervisor of the township. I also was instrumental and uh, served as Adjutant General of the Richmond Post of the Grand Army of the Republic. For those of you that don't know, the Grand Army of the Republic was the Veterans Association of the Union Army. Uh, we, you'll see that I proudly wear my badge, and, and uh, I was very honored to uh, be a part of that. Uh, if you get a chance to look here, there's some badges, and I'll pass this around. They're actually, so they would have what they call encampments, and they'd come into town, you know, we'd have veterans come into town, and camp out and tell stories about the war. That's basically what it was. And they got very elaborate in presenting who they were and where they were from. Uh, we were no different. You know, we had that badge that I can't even remember at this point if that if that badge for the Huron Rangers was at the time of the war or if it was after. It's kind of all mushed in together. Uh, but Interesting note, if you're ever in the Methodist Church here in town, uh, you will, if you go in the back, what is the back of the church, and you turn around, and you face what is Main Street now, in the top left-hand corner, in stained glass, is a GAR representation of a badge. So, some historical thing that you can stop by and see. Um, we met, our local chapter met, as best I can remember, either in the Fire Hall, um, the Richmond Fire Hall, or the Masonic Lodge, as best I, as best I can. It's a long time ago, but I, I believe that's where we were. I do want to pass these around. I've kept it all my my great-great-grandson has that. That's my U.S.-issued belt buckle. And this, I am very proud of. I'm not going to pass this one. This is a sword, even though I wasn't in a lot of battles that I brought back from the war. You know that great-great-grandson, he had this looked at. Best we can understand, 
it's a French sword. And because it was French, there was probably a Confederate sword. Just something I happened to pick up on. So that's been in the family all those years. So I've talked about my homes. I'm going to close that up. When the three boys were growing up and in, in, uh, about a quarter of the mile off to the north on Croner Road was a schoolhouse. You see a little boy in a, in a sweater. That's little Elgin. And standing next to him a little bit taller is his brother Lloyd. I'd like to talk a little bit about that family. That's Bert's family. I didn't want to pick on one, but my great-great-grandson wanted to hear the story, so that's what we're doing. So Bert and Ida, um, Bert was born in 1866. His great-grandson, great Glenn, was born 100 years later in 1966. Uh, they had six children. There was Fern, Fern Oak. She is buried right here with her daughter, Elma. son Cal, Cal, Kelvin. Um, there was Mary, Forrest, who is right here, with Florence. Forrest uh, lived around town, but then eventually moved up north to um, an area known, well, would be uh, Tawas area. And he would be the caretaker for a camp that the boys went to. Billy, Bert, Dave all went to a place called Bryant Camp. Bryant Camp is still in existence. In fact, there's some fellow firefighters on the Richmond Fire Department that are members there. Um, I'd like to show you some pictures of that. Some other ones in here. I don't want to pass this around because it's. Mm -hmm. This is just, you can kind of see. I don't want to get too graphic on you, but it just gives you a rep idea of the. Pretty cool to have pictures that the boys thought to take pictures now. So think about it, if you would. Tawas today takes by automobile about three hours. Turn of the century of the 20th century, there wasn't, there was very few automobiles. You wouldn't have taken an automobile there. They got up there by rail. They got up there by rail car. Um, let's see if I, I got some others to show. Okay, so there's Bert. There's Sam Weeks. Sam Weeks was Della's brother. Sam is buried. See that headstone over there with the round ball on top of it? He's buried right behind there. His nephew was Ray Weeks. Sam's nephew was Ray Weeks. Ray, Ray's buried right up here of Weeks Meatpacking. So there's that. I've got a better picture. Oh, here were the accommodations at Bryant Camp. You can see the bunks. So that's David. That was Sam. I guess they double bunked. George Bailey. A couple others there. Um, there's, there's Billy, 
There's Bert. There's David. Sam and Ray are in there. Got, got a couple more I'd like to share. So, this is kind of an interesting picture. I, I, I really like this one. Brings a lot of history into town. So, there's Ray Weeks. Don Foster. Don Foster's dad. That's Don Foster's dad right there. And then Sam Weeks again. You got to look at Sam Weeks. Sam Weeks is quite a character. I mean, look at that sweater. Isn't that precious? <laughs> and then we've got a picture in here of Bert's front parlor. They were quite crushed. I mean, if that's not a Victorian parlor, I don't know what is. So, I'm going to keep that. Be careful about that. So, getting back to, to the rest of Bert's family, I kind of got sidetracked there. So, we went through... Mary Forrest. Then there was Glenn. Glenn is buried right over there, just in front of that flag there. Uh, right over there. Glenn was born in uh, 1895. Uh, then there was Lloyd. And I can't remember if Lloyd was 1903 or 1904. And then Elgin was born in 1905. And I, we picked this part of the of the family though to tell another story about the Quicks. Uh, the Quicks, um, and I'm proud to say I was the one that started it, um, have been involved with the U.S. Postal Service, and were involved close to a hundred years. So let me kind of run through that. I started, you know, with a team of horses and a and a buckboard carrying mail. From the post office out to the rail to the rail line out to the depot from the north end of town that's where the post office was if you're not familiar the bank here at the north end of town just to the north of that on that same side was where the post office was um so i i started started that and then bert started carrying mail to the rural areas and he was responsible for Rural Route 2 which is still called Rural Route 2 by the way and it involves Richmond Township and Columbus Township. He served in that until his death in 1913. Best, we, best I can remember somewhere about 1890 is probably when he started. Uh, my great -grand grandson was supposed to bring a picture to share with you that shows him in a sleigh with U.S. mail on the top of it that would have been really nice to show you, but he forgot it. <laughs> Still trying to teach that boy. Um, but he, but he would, um, you know, he did that until his death. Now, her sister, uh, his sister Fern did some substituting for him and I think served a little bit of time after his death and she would tell Cal stories of getting stuck on Gratiot when it was so muddy and getting stuck with the horse and you know sleigh or whatever it was you know think about rural and and what's funny knowing what I know happened later is that the rural people had mail service before the people in town did. People in town had to come to the post office to get their mail. People in the in the rural areas got it delivered to them. Interesting to think about. So, eventually though, I mentioned Glenn. 
Glenn was born in Richmond, somehow moved to Wisconsin. Where I can't remember how he got there, but that's where he was. He didn't graduate from Richmond High School. He came back to town in approximately 1918 took over World Route 2. Glenn would serve on that position until um, 1960 when he retired. He lived on um, Ridge Road here uh, in the big house um, and then in uh, 1960 uh, moved out to uh, Warner Road uh, and he died in 1966. Uh, that he, he died uh, three months before I was born. Sorry, I stepped out of character. <laughs> There's a reason why that name's important to that great great grandson. Because uh, as as Glenn was serving Rural Route 2, Elgin joined the post office as a clerk in 1937. Incidentally enough, in 1937, that great great grandson's dad was born. Dale was born in 1937. Uh, Glenn had served um, in the, um, he was a pilot. He was a pilot on the Great Lakes. Did that for about 10 years. Served out of the New Haven Foundry and eventually uh, in 1944 became postmaster. Served in that until 1950. And there was a little bit of time and actually he put together the route of as just before he died, he was putting together the route of the two city routes in the city. Cousin Cal would eventually become postmaster. He was acting postmaster in uh, 1952, took it on in 1954. He was born in 1924. He was a World War II veteran. Probably, he, he was the youngest postmaster in the county and probably at the time one of the youngest in the state at age 30. He would serve in that post until 1979. Hmm. So that means that the Quicks probably had someone in the post office almost 100 years. So we're very, very proud of that. We're proud of our service for our country. Um, and I would eventually uh, move into town in um, 1892. 94. Where I lived was in a uh, house that burned in the late 1990s and it's the empty lot as you drive back into town there's an empty lot at the north end of town just past the um, Schofield house. Not just to the south of there that's where I died. Um, actually died in my son's uh, David's home in 1990. So, hope you learned a little bit about the quick history. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, as my great great grandson, have a super day. Oh well, yes, I am Mary Lou Bolt. However, I was born Mary Lou Bryant in Battle Creek, Michigan, and I lived 77 years too. But now I want you to know that I graduated from Battle Creek High School in 1923, and then I went to Western. Normal Teachers College and studied art and, and music. And by the way, that's called Western Michigan now. Um, but anyway, it was Western State Normal. And I studied art and uh, just had a wonderful time there. Uh, but somehow I ended up in Richmond, Michigan, that nice little small friendly town right here in Richmond, Michigan. I mean, from the west side of the state to the east side. State. What do you think about that? Well, anyway, um, I think I was there in 1925. You know, did you notice I graduated 23 in 23 from high school and 25 from college? Two years. Well, that's how they did it in those days, okay? All right. Now, I ended up in Richmond and I made many friends. And it was a very friendly town. And of course, one of the friends I made at school and, and in the community, and one of the friends that I made, of course, was that Mr. Ben Bolt. He was the coach. He came a few years after I was there. And uh, anyway, I want to tell you about one day in 1937, I was teaching my uh, second 
great art class. And there was a cute little boy in there. He was a dear little thing, seven years old. And his name was Jimmy Weeks. I think he had something to do with that Weeks meat family, you know, that has been around for a hundred years or so. But anyway, one day I heard Jimmy and the boys over in the corner talking and saying something. And they were all excited about it and everything. So I kind of went over there and tried to listen. And they were saying, roses are red, violets are blue. I saw Ben Bolt kissing Mary Lou. Oh, oh my word. Oh. <laughs> well, needless to say, not long after that, Ben and I went to New York, New York, and got married. So it was a wonderful thing. But, 1937, think about it. What was going on in the country in 1937? What was going on? Some... Prohibition. You're right. Well, no, not prohibition. Yes, prohibition. No, that was over. It goes with that, though. What did you say? Depression. The depression was going on. And do you know, at that time, only one paycheck was allowed per family. Uh-huh. And then, on top of that, they didn't like married lady teachers either. So, I guess I couldn't teach for a little while. But that was all over by the 40s, okay? Now, we go on, and all through the years, I really enjoyed being a part of the community. I loved sharing my God-given talents. I was a pretty artist. And I loved sharing those talents in, at school and in town. Now, at school, for instance, they'd have dances and banquets and all that sort of thing. They went in town, too, and I would get in there and help them figure out uh, the theme of a dance and the colors and the decorations. But we'd get into the decorations, and I loved helping with that. Or if they had banquets, make the favors for the table, and it, it would be just wonderful. Well, as time went on, uh, you know, Ben got his, and he'll be telling about it later, but he had his gas station. And at his gas station, it was wonderful because it was a great big window. And I got to decorate that window many, many times. I got to put displays in there, and I just loved doing it. You know, like at Halloween and Christmas and Easter and all of that. So that was great fun. Now, one day, um, I, and I want to make sure that I don't forget anything here. Uh, one day, my dear friend, Lois Fletcher, uh, came up to me. That's Mrs. Jack Fletcher. You know, the, the, they're the greenhouse people. Anyway, um, she came up and she had heard about this new material that I could use to make all of my displays and my figures and things like that. She said it was great because it was lightweight and you could cut it easily and it held its shape. I mean, I use corrugated paper a lot too, but this other thing sounded interesting and it was called, oh, styrofoam. That was in the mid-40s and we discovered styrofoam. So Lois and I went down to Detroit one day and we got a whole load of it and I used it for years and it was wonderful. I'm going to show you this picture. Well, that's not it. Oh, this here. No, that's not it. Oh my goodness. Here we go. I love this. Here's a picture of me. Mary Lou's hobby craft, real asset to the community. Wasn't that wonderful? And see, there are a couple of figures that I made there. I just love that. That was fun. Now, um, I want to make sure I tell you everything. I told you about that. Oh, yes, of course, linole linoleum tiles. She was very busy. She made these linoleum tiles. Now, of course, every year I made all of our... You want to pass them around and we can... Here you go. You can pass yours that way. You can check it out. Look and see how the, let, the, the words are all backwards, you know. They have to be backwards when you do it on, you know, on the paper and all that sort of thing. And this is, a, this is one of the Christmas cards. I made our own Christmas cards every year. And I sometimes did it for other people. 
And this is one for the Rowleys, and I bet some of you know the Rowleys. But this is one Christmas card she made for the Rowleys. Thing that I wanted to tell you about was um, every year when someone, you know, the teachers would would uh, retire, there'd be retired teachers, and so over over the year she would collect. Well, she would make a scrapbook. She'd put a scrapbook together. Now other people would contribute to the scrapbook, but it would be a scrapbook about that teacher doing whatever it was she was teaching, or he was teaching, and so forth. And the last day she taught then they would give her they would give her the scrapbook and it that was a pretty nice thing to do um, I, uh, I had a little business I have to tell you about that I had a little business in 1951 and it, I put a flyer in the newspaper that said do you like flies no well then why have them try this D flyer unit little green flower pot and it, it works really good in farms and things. It's noisy, isn't it? Good grief. Okay, I'll start again. Okay, it works in farms, bakeries, hotels, dairies, and grocery stores. And it kills everything. Flies and moths and mosquitoes and all kinds of things. Roaches and all of that. And some of the users in the community were uh, Steiner's, Home Restaurant, Bam and Sample, Schultz's Dairy, Winkle's Grocery Store, um, the uh, First and Oz, uh, Steyer's Drug Store, so lots of places like that. And uh, it was only $14.95, this is in 1951, $14.95 and a dollar fifty for refills. See? And all you had to do was call me. And my telephone number, by the way, was 314. <laughs> okay, now, um, I told you that. Or, oh, okay, now, I retired in 1976. And I taught for about 32 years. But you know what? I didn't talk, teach steady. I mean, one time they cut out art, for instance. So they put me in some other class, and I taught that for a while. Sometimes I taught just half days. I mean, I, I didn't just teach all the way through, but but it took over 30, 32 years. And uh, I, uh, let's see, I uh, always, oh, well, yes, of course. <laughs> I was always involved in the community. And by the way, I belonged to the Ladies Diversity Club. That was a very special, nice club. And they did nice things in the community. And, um, we met once a month, and we would talk late into the night many times, and we drank a lot of coffee, <laughs> definitely, a lot of coffee. And then I was also a member of the Lionesses, and of course Ben was in the Lions Club, and so the ladies were the ladies part of the Lions Club, and I was the president in 1943, so that was very special. So all in all, I was a very busy gal. Wasn't I, Ben? Absolutely, Mary Lou. Oh, okay. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Ben <laughs> Bolt. Um, I was born in 1905 in Adrian, Michigan. Um, as a youngster, I uh, was very, very competitive, loved sports. Uh, lettered in uh, baseball, basketball, football, and in high school at Adrian High School there. Um, after high school, I took my career to Albion College, actually. And, uh, you know, today I'd probably say go Brits, but Albion didn't actually have a mascot when I was there. They didn't get their mascot until 2011. But um, while at uh, Albion, I was a letterman in basketball and baseball and a two-time all-MIAA captain of the football team. In, uh, in 1925, I came to Richmond High School to accept my first teaching position and meet Mary Lou. And um, I also was named the head football coach uh, the first year I became a teacher. So after a few years of working with the program, we developed quite a bit and you know I got kind of a name for myself as we won 10 Tri-County Championships in a row as the Richmond Fighting Fools back then. 
So, yeah, fighting, fighting fools is our mascot, uh, not the Blue Devils of today. But um, in around, you know, right after I got married to uh, Mary Lou in 1937, uh, a few years of teaching more at the, the high school here. Uh, you know, I believe uh, with the uncertain times and with World War II and everything like that, uh, I decided that I wanted to, you know, commit to our financial future as a family. And in 1941, I actually opened up the Gulf Service Station um, on Muttonville Lane. It's actually where First State Bank is now, um, but that would have been my uh, my Gulf Service Station back then. Um, so, you know, as Mary Lou mentioned, she uh, she loved decorating out my service station, and uh, I spent a great deal of time uh, working there over the next 18 years or so um, as a member of the community and servicing the community in terms of, you know, donating to the Richmond Community Schools and multiple programs and, and things like that. Um, I believe it was around the late 1950s when I actually took a job as a keeper of the peace for Lennox Township um, and serving as a uh, you know serving as an officer for them and in 1959 I left the service station and went back to Richmond High School um, and I served as a guidance counselor uh, for several for three years there um, and up until 1961 um, so in 1961, I retired from education, and five years later, uh, at the age of 62, I passed away, uh, leaving Mary Ellen. Mary Lou. <laughs> Mary Lou. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's, um, you know, the rest is history, I suppose. Thank you. We had a good time, didn't we? we sure did. <laughs> well, I'm Marsha Fletcher Wisneski. And I'm uh, Patricia Lois, and it's Bartosowitz. I was called Patty as I was growing up. And we're the daughters of Lois and Jack Fletcher, who owned the greenhouse. Great. Uh, I want to thank my cousin, Doug Rasmussen, for the Fletcher history. I'm going to be sharing with you. My grandfather, John Guy Fletcher, was a direct descendant of an Englishman, Robert Fletcher, born in 1592 in Clemsford, England. Robert came to the New World around 1630 and left a straight line of 14 generations of male Fletcher descendants through 2018. This bloke Broken, unbroken Fletcher line has thus preserved the name through over 400 years in England, the colonies, and the U.S. John Guy Fletcher was the great seventh grandson of Robert Fletcher. John Guy Fletcher, my grandfather, John Gates Fletcher, his grandmother, Eunice Baxter Fletcher, came to Michigan from New York in 1843 and settled in Kidville, Ionia County. When John Guy Fletcher's grandparents came to Michigan, it was only six years after Michigan became a state. The line of Fletchers in Michigan has been continuous in Michigan for 177 years through 2021. And this is a picture of uh, John and Mabel. John Guy Fletcher was born January 22, 1878, in Lowell, Michigan. He was known as Guy to his family and friends. He married Mabel Anna Bentley on June 19, 1911, in Detroit, Michigan. They had two children, John Guy Fletcher, Jr., born in 1916, and Laura Jean Fletcher Rasmussen in 1919. During the Great Depression, the Fletchers started the Fletcher Greenhouse Every Blooming Thing. They had a retail florist business and grew most of their flowers. John Guy died in 1953 and Mabel in 1954, only two months apart. They're buried here. The Fletcher floral business was owned and operated by John Guy 
and Mabel Fletcher and their son and wife, Jack and Lois Fletcher. It was established in 1933. There was only one greenhouse until 1935 and another was built in. And in 1941, an addition was built to the original house and a second addition was built in 1947. Also in 1947, the workroom was enlarged and the boilers re were, re were moved to a larger room in the barn. Hot water for the boilers is used to heat the greenhouses. In 1950, another large addition was added, about almost doubling the area under glass and a new greenhouse was started. It is believed that the chimney on the barn is the highest in the area, being 50 feet high and 4 feet in diameter. And I would like to introduce you now to my mother, Lois. Thank you. Hello and welcome. Some of you may know who I am, but if you don't, I'm Lois May Gerber Fletcher. And my memory isn't what it used to be, so I have some note cards here to help me along. So please bear with me. I was born in November 10th, 1921 in Muskegon, Michigan to Alice and John Gerber. Dad worked for the American Wire Company and they transed him to Port Huron, so we moved there when I was 10. I went to St. Stephen's High School. I married John, Jack as he was known, Guy Fletcher II on June 19th, 1941. We had four children, Patricia Lois, John Guy the second, the third, whoops, he's the third, not the second. What am I talking about? We called him Jack, Marcia Jean, who was named after my best friend, and Annie Jean Rasmussen, who was Jack's sister, and John Paul, who was named after my dad. So proud of that. After we were married, we lived with our parents at 603 Main Street, but it's now known as 7007 Main Street. It's a large red brick house with big white pillars across from Madison Street. Jack's parents owned the greenhouse business. After Jack took a short class at MSU, Michigan State, Go Green, he for horticulture, he started to run the business and help his father. I myself learned from trial and error how to build beautiful floral arrangements oh, for weddings and funerals and birthdays and all kinds of special occasions. Now at this time, we were growing all of our own flowers. We continued to own and operate the greenhouses and the retail business until after our parents retired. Now, I swear, we have greenhouses and a barn, several greenhouses and a barn. We were known for our calla lilies. They were in high demand, and Jack would drive down to Detroit several times a week to deliver to many florists who were begging for our calla lilies. In June of 1943, Jack enlisted in the Navy. He was about to be drafted, and he really wanted to be in the Navy, so he enlisted before he could be drafted. Pat was only six months old. He served as a quartermaster, second class in the Pacific Theater on the USS Bowditch. Boy, I sure did miss him while he was away, and it was so hard not to worry whether he would get killed or not return. In the late 50s, we decided to turn into growing geraniums. We gave up the retail business. We were known across the area of Michigan for the quality of our plants. We gave them a lot of love. One plant, if you can believe this, was 12 years old. It was five and a half feet tall, and it measured six feet across. It produced thousands of short shoots off of it, and in any one summer had over 300 blossoms. We affectionately called her Mama Lois. Check out the picture. You know, it was really hard work running a greenhouse. We were up before sunrise to beat the heat, because in those glass houses, you can imagine the sun pouring in 
all day long how hot it really got. There was no air conditioning in those buildings. We had four houses of geraniums that had to be watered every day by hand with a hose. Oh, and we had to deadhead them. There were hundreds of plants and this was mainly my job and I was on my feet many hours. People came from all over Michigan to the Fletcher's greenhouse to buy our geraniums. Sometimes when we would drive over to our cottage in St. Clair, I was always proud to see that many houses along the river planted Fletcher's geraniums and it just made me feel so good. We work long hours, especially during the holidays. Mother's Day, Christmas, Easter, and sometimes we'd have a couple funerals and a wedding all at the same time. That was crazy. One of my favorite seasons was Easter. In our sales room, we had a room full of wonderful aromas of hyacinths and Easter lilies. One year I remember, we always made corsages for the high school kids for their proms. And we were busy, got them all made, all the ribbons on and everything all set. And a tornado warning happened. And guess what? They had to cancel the prom. So they wouldn't last all week. So the following weekend, there we were staying up late in, into the evening, replenishing all those corsages for the high school kids. Community involvement was always very important to Jack and to myself. Jack was a chartered member of the Richmond VFW Post 6802. I was in the Ladies Auxiliary. He was a chartered member of the Lions and he was a Mason. He helped start the Babe Ruth Baseball League in town in 1958 and he was on the Village Council. He was president of the Village of Richmond from 1956 to 1958. Jack's hobby was racehorses. We had Fletch, Royal Gerb, and Babe, and we were lucky enough to have a couple winners. We retired in 1967, over 30 years from the business, to St. Clair, Michigan. And yes, we did take Mama Lois with us. As I look back and reflect on my life, I'm so grateful for my parents and their guidance and together with my loving devoted husband and my beautiful children we made a happy successful life at 7007 Main Street Fletcher's greenhouse every blooming thing thank you and now you can proceed over to the mausoleum to listen to my brother-in-law, Ken Rasmussen, who is married to Jack's sister, Jean. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Rasmussen. My wife and I are resting right here. My, since 2007, May, actually. I started my life in 1913. By any standards, my life could be judged as complicated. I hope that you might add some additional adjectives to the characterization of my life as I go through it with you. The usual mechanism for presenting one's life is birth to death. I chose not to take that path, and in point of fact, I'm going to start the discussion with death. We are in a cemetery, and let's first discuss mine. Mine was peaceful. I died at the Henry Ford Adult Care Facility in Dearborn. I was supported by family and friends, and I was in good health right up until the terminal event. My wife's was different. She was afflicted with a long-term illness. I was able to provide the bulk of the terminal care for my wife. I took a great deal of pride in that. But there was a third death that impacted me significantly. I was engaged to a woman named Virginia. She lived in Grand Rapids. 
she and several of her friends were killed in a very tragic automobile accident when a drunk driver crossed the road. I was devastated. With the help of family and friends and a keen interest in a very attractive young Fletcher, I recovered and I made that young Fletcher my wife. She is resting beside me. During my lifetime, I valued education. Just a few words about my own. First of all, I loved pharmacy, and I was able to attend Ferris School of Pharmacy, which at the time I enrolled was a two-year program. During my second year, it was converted to a four-year program, and in spite of extreme financial hardship, I was able to complete the four-year program. And I stood for the first four-year examination for pharmacists at my graduation, and I'm pleased to report I scored the top score. The wind has flipped this up. I want to flip it down if I can, because I'm asking you to pay attention to the historic perspective of my life. Several of the major events are on that card. I valued education in others. Uh, I ran a scout troop for a while that was facilitated by, achieve, by my achieving the Eagle Scout Award. I was an activist for the betterment of schools in Richmond. I was the chair of one of the committees that worked hard to get the construction of the Willow Lee School. I also served on committees to get the new high school constructed, and I recently read the Richmond School District's report on the status of the schools today. I take great pride in the fact that the Richmond schools feature outstanding students, outstanding faculty, and outstanding programs. Let's talk for a minute about my profession. As I freely admitted, I love pharmacy. After I graduated, I started as an employee of the Denton Pharmacy and spent considerable time in New Haven. I was then able to purchase the store in Richmond. As an owner, I was able to do a number of things. First of all, I was able to treat every customer with dignity and respect. This was the heights of the civil rights movement. I was able to set store hours and my availability for after hours pharmacy needs. My availability was essentially unlimited. If someone ran out of their insulin on Sunday morning, I would open the store and take care of their needs. During the ownership of the store, I kept two book sets of books. I kept a conventional letter, ledger, but I also kept a little black book. And in the little black book, if you could not afford the charges at, of the pharmacy at the time of service, your name went in the little black book with the amount. During the time your name was in the little black book, there was no interest charge, nor were, were there any pressures applied. When you settled your account, your name came out of the little black book. During my time at the store, I also, had, during one period, was the provider of textbooks and reference material for students in the Richmond Community Schools. The Supreme Court of Michigan decided that school districts would be responsible for all materials needed by students, and that function was removed from my store. But I continued to supply to students of Richmond not only textbooks, but reference material as well. I was part of the change 
in pharmacy. When I bought the store, there was a soda fountain in the pharmacy. I took the soda fountain out. I'm pleased to say I donated a fair amount of the antique material in my store to my alma mater, Ferris State, where it is today as part of their museum. I sold the store and retired at the right time for me. The change of character in retail pharmacy would have been very difficult for me to accommodate. Talk just a minute about my athletic ability. When I was at Ferris, I was the singles tennis champion. When I worked in Richmond, there was no tennis court. So there was a considerable hiatus before I resumed playing tennis. In spite of two back surgeries, I was characterized by my contemporaries, often in Florida, as a formidable opponent on the tennis court. I learned to put English on the tennis ball and achieved significant success on the tennis court. I also played golf and again by contemporaries was considered a very competitive golfer. My city offered me a significant honor. Both my wife and I were named Grand Marshals of the Richmond Good Old Days Parade 1985 version. During that ceremony, I rode in a brand new fire engine red Ford Thunderbird convertible. And I think about the historic perspective of the vehicles that I started my life with. Um, during the Depression, the sport coat that I took to Ferris became unwearable. It was the depth of the Depression, and I asked my parents for $50 to buy a new sport coat and tie. Where that money came from in the depths of the Depression is a mystery to me to this day. I do want to break character for just a minute and discuss one other aspect of his life. I'm now Pat McClellan. I practiced medicine in Richmond during the time that Ken had the pharmacy. I had a patient who was in congestive heart failure, diabetes, and hypertension. The patient was on multiple medications. The patient developed a malignancy, and I sent the patient to an oncologist. He, the oncologist, put the patient on three additional medications. I was extremely concerned about the possibility of an adverse drug-to-drug -drug interaction. I shared that information with Ken and told him I was headed to the hospital to research the possibility of drug-to-drug -drug interaction. He said, give me an hour and I'll call you back. And he did. And he had the information. Ken Rasmussen, in spite of starting when this was the transportation, stayed current. He subscribed to a drug-to-drug -drug interaction program when they were not widespread at all. He was a professional colleague. He was a gentleman in every sense of the word. I miss him today. I thank you for your attention.